My, my family, big Star Wars people, uh, and when I first met my wife, we, we talked and she said she'd never seen Star Wars. And I relayed that to my brother and he said, I don't think she's the one for you. <laughs> and now it's all changed and she has other great qualities that, uh, that allow her to be a part of our family. Uh, but just very interesting that I happen to be you know, speaking on this time. Uh, but I, I really like the idea. We got the Revenge of the Saints. We're going to get into to St. Paul, the Apostle Paul tonight. It's such a broad topic, uh, but I'm going to rock into a few points that I think will really sit well with us and, and, and maybe, well, I, it challenges me, so hopefully it will challenge you as, as we work through this also. Uh, but the idea of the theme, if you don't remember anything from what I say from this point on, is just the idea of fighting back with grace and love. You know, that's, that's where we're rocking. That's where Josh is going to rock tomorrow. He's doing all the services tomorrow. Uh, so if you don't get anything out of this one, just listen to the ones tomorrow. You'll get something out of it. I have no doubt. Uh, but we got the, uh, the, the Apostle Paul tonight. You know, St. Paul, the Apostle Paul. It's actually a movie coming out in March starring Jim Caviezel. Uh, I'm not necessarily advocating it because I haven't seen it yet. But... I'm sure Jim Caviezel, he was Jesus, and now he's Luke. Just FYI, if you want to watch that, go for it. But Paul was a, a pillar. He's a titan of the faith. You know, if anything about Christianity, you got Peter, you got Paul, those guys doing incredible things in the faith. And tonight we're going to be talking about Paul. Uh, he also wrote most of the New Testament, a, a great majority of the New Testament. So when you're reading through the New Testament, and when I don't hit on some things about Paul, I encourage you this week to get into the New Testament and kind of get a little bit more of an understanding of who Paul is, uh, even more so than what I can bring in my 25, 30 minutes. His name was also Saul. And I know that can be kind of confusing. Uh, I'm just giving you a little bit of the history. You know, Saul, as I believe it, I'm no scholar, but Saul was his Hebrew name and Jewish name. Uh, and then Paul, or maybe I'm getting this wrong. Let me get, yeah, Saul's his Hebrew name. And he was a Roman citizen, and Paul was his Latin name. So you see this mix and match because Paul was really big on being who he needed to be. His message never changed, but the way that he delivered his message would change depending on who he was talking to. So when you hear this interchange, you know, sometimes it's said that, oh, when, when he found Jesus, Jesus changed his name. That's not the case. The case is he has two names, which was very common uh, back in those times for Jews to have two, two separate names. But Paul didn't begin as a titan of the faith. He actually started with a Star Wars theme on the dark side. And so if you'll power on your Bibles, I also want to say welcome to the people who are online. And, and if you're expecting to, to listen to Josh, sorry he's not here. Uh, but don't turn away. We got good stuff coming tonight. So uh, turn to Acts Acts 9 is where we're going to be, but before I, I read that, I want to give you a little bit of a background kind of before we get to this scene. You'll set the stage just a little bit. And so Stephen, in Acts 6, so a few chapters before, in Acts 6, 8, we, we got Stephen, and it says in there that he was a man full of God's grace and power and did great wonders and miraculous signs. So this guy, incredible guy, follower of Christ, and he's going around with, by the power of the Holy Spirit, just letting people know Jesus is the man. And the people disliked what the Holy Spirit was saying through Stephen. So they dragged him out of the town and they stoned him. Well, this leads us to this next moment in Acts. In Acts 8, 1 and 3 is our first encounter with Saul. It's not going to be up there. I'm just going to read it for you. And it says, and Saul was there giving approval to his death. Remember, they pulled Stephen out, they stoned him, and Saul was there giving approval to his death. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. So now we catch up to Saul in Acts 9. So if you're there, here we go. If I was there, that would be better. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, 
he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the time to be able to come here on a Saturday evening and just praise you in song and also praise you in the word that you've given us. Uh, may you open the hearts. May your Holy Spirit be here. And may my words be your words. And that each person may hear it a little bit differently, but they may hear it the way that you want them to hear it, Lord. We praise you and thank you for this time together. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to rock just, I got three points, because that's what they say you're supposed to do when you give thing. Have little three points. So my first one, after reading this, I thought it was so interesting that it doesn't say, Saul, Saul, why did you persecute Stephen? Saul, Saul, why did you persecute my church? He said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Which leads me to, if you can get your best Yoda voice on my first point, it would be, alone you are not, knelt before the throne you have. <laughs> Which pretty much, you're not alone when you kneel at the feet of Jesus. And so what I mean by that is that very point in that when you understand, when, when you understand the grace and love of Jesus Christ and you're within his family, when you're persecuted, when the other people who are part of the family are persecuted, he's persecuted and he stands at the front. He's not hanging out in the back saying, here you guys go, why don't you go, go fight for me and do that thing. No, he stands at the front and says, why are you persecuting me? And I don't think there's anything greater to understand than Jesus gave us the example that, that Saul was fighting against Jesus' people and Jesus fought back. And so if we can understand and appreciate that and go through that, we can know that Jesus is fighting for us currently in that same respect. And he also fought for us on the cross. And if you don't know that, where he came, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for us, went into the grave, didn't just hang out in the grave, but he rose again to show life over death, to give us a chance at everlasting life, to give us that if we take ownership of it. He fought for us then, and he's still fighting for us now. Just as when Paul was persecuted in the church, he stood up and said, I got this. No longer are you going to be doing that to us, Paul. And so let's take an example from Jesus as he fights for us and fight each day with grace and love. It's kind of where we're at, to fight back with this grace and love and remind the devil that he's a loser. I think we all want to make sure that we do that. Now, I don't know if this is going to be up on the board, but I'm going to go to Acts, I'm going to Acts 9, and I'm going to go to 19 to 22. So we have Saul. He's just been on the road to Damascus. He's been blinded by Jesus. Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Saul's just like, Lord, I didn't know it was you. This is incredible. He gets blinded. So he can't see when he wakes up, and his guys take him to Damascus. And there's a guy there, Ananias, who Jesus talked to. And he ends up you know, putting his hands on him, brings his, uh, brings his sight back. And then we get to this point right here. And it says in, in 19, it goes, And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. 
It's a motto of the church, more or less, that, well, it doesn't sound as good in, in Yoda speak, but uh, too far from God, no one is. Life changed through Jesus Christ, experience you can't. That was kind of an Asian, sorry. It's a little <laughs> mixture of the both. I apologize on that one. But no one is too far from God to experience life change through Jesus Christ. And Paul, just reading his story, is the example of that. That he was persecuting the church. And yet then, a few verses later, he's dominating for Jesus Christ, as we just read. But it's understandable that people would be a little scared. I would think of it like Darth Vader. If he didn't die, and I know you loyalists would be like, what, he died, Justin, we can't do anything. He did have some life change, you know, even on his deathbed. He was like, oh, you know, Luke's like, I want to save you. And he's like, you've already saved me. Tell your sister, you already know. So let's say he stays alive, and all of a sudden, you know, we go to, you know, Luke takes his dad to the rebellion camp, and all of a sudden the guys see Darth Vader right there. They're going to be a little scared. And Darth is like, no, no, it's cool, guys. It's like, I'm not the same way I used to be. They're like, oh, okay, yeah, hey, welcome, man. And then all of a sudden, Darth is just like, <laughs> chokehold going on him. And he's just like, oh, I'm just kidding, guys. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just joking. And if you don't know Star Wars, you have no idea what I just did. <laughs> and that's okay. And you won't get that analogy, but that's fine. Because the same way as we get Paul here going into the church now and being a part of the, the disciples and meeting all these new Christians, and they're afraid of him, and it could very easily push Paul away. But the idea here is that there is no one too far from God. The incredible, terrible things that he had done before, and yet he had an experience with God, and he experienced that life changed through Jesus Christ, and he became a titan. So though he started on the dark side, Man, the force is strong with that one. The Holy Spirit went through him like none other. And he did so many incredible things. And so my call to you is you are not too far from God. If you're sitting here and you're like, I've done so many things, you are not too far from God. Don't give up on yourself. And my call for those who do know God, don't give up on that person who seems like they're too far. How easy is it to judge and think, no way? I mean, just think of the guy seeing Paul. Think of the worst person you can think in your life. Sometimes you're like, I don't really want them to know Jesus. And yet they could be such an incredible proponent for Christ that you don't even know. And yet you've already given up on him. So don't give up on yourself. You're not too far. Don't give up on the guy next to you because he's not too far either. Because we must fight back with the grace and love so the world knows that no one is too far. And now for, for my final point, this is kind of, I don't know, this is the one I, I, I really like, but it's also very, very challenging to myself, you know, as I think through it. And this is through Paul's life. So we've gone through this story, but Paul really modeled something throughout his life. And what he modeled was Change your life, time with Jesus will. Uh, I got to work on my Yoda voice. But time with Jesus will change your life. And so if we, it's not before, but it's after your encounter with Jesus that life change happens. Doesn't mean you can't better yourself before you know Jesus. But a lot of times, you know, if you're around, it thinks, oh, we need to get better and then I'll go hang out with Jesus. Now, Jesus says, come to me, and the life change will happen after we're spending time together. And so if you go, well, we'll put it up on the board, 1 Corinthians 15, 9. So this is Paul uh, early in his ministry, and he says, For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. You're like, wow, this guy is really humble. I am the least of the apostles. Well, he's just talking about the people who have had an experience, like an actual experience with God. Like Jesus came to them, and he says, of all these people, I am the least. Okay. Well, then we go on to Ephesians 3.8. And it says, uh, although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me. 
So I don't know if you're seeing the change here. So at first he says, I am the least of all the apostles. Of the best of the best, I am the worst. And then he goes, you know what? Of all believers, as he's spending time with Jesus, he starts to realize some things about God's grace and love that's been bestowed upon him. And he says, of all the believers, I am the least. And then we get to this, this last verse in 1 Timothy 1.15. He's talking to Timothy, who's a disciple of his, and he says, I want to tell you this. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save, to save sinners of whom I am the worst. I don't know if you see it there. The fact that he goes from I'm the worst of the worst, the worst of the best, to the worst of the chosen, to the worst of all people. As he realized the grace and love that was bestowed upon him by Jesus Christ, humility set in. And it's not this false humility. I like how C.S. Lewis put it. He said, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Let that sit in. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Less. Because Paul's still super powerful. I mean, he's got the Holy Spirit rocking through him. He's doing some incredible things throughout this entire life that he was able to give. And so he didn't think any, there's any less of the potential that he could do. He just thought of himself less because God got so big in his life. When he got to understand the grace and love that he was shown. Now, Neil Garwood, I don't know if he's here tonight, but, but he, re, he reminded me that he was reading a devotional, and Paul shows this so good, that it's not the strength of our faith that we should be concerned with, rather the object of our faith, Jesus. Because so I'll say, I get stuck on verse 1 and 2. I don't know about you, but I get stuck on verse 1 and 2. Where at times I'm like, oh, you know, the best of the best. Yeah, I'm, I'm not that good. Yeah, of all Christians, I'm not that good. But like taking that transition of all people, that humility does not always like to set in the way I would like it. I don't know if you follow that with me. But how often is it that we encounter Jesus in our lives? If you've encountered him, we encounter Jesus in our lives. We see him and we move towards him. And then within that walk, Somehow this orbit just happens where we get so close and then we just kind of start going round and round, not any closer, but ever so slightly drifting away. And all of a sudden that passion and desire that we had when we first encountered Christ and that grace and love that we understood just slowly diminishes and different questions start popping into our mind. We're like, oh, what a... What are people going to think if I do this? Oh, how do I fit in? Oh, what? Well, everyone's doing this. I think I need to go do this. Oh, I need to be a part of this. Oh, I got to do that. Oh, man, what are they going to think? What are they going to do? How am I going to be responded to? And those are all things that will come up in our mind. But when those come, because all we're doing is getting into, instead of that pursuit of Christ, we get into just that little... Um, the, the, religious, the religious routine. You feel me on that? You ever get caught in that religious routine? Maybe you're there right now. Or all of a sudden it's like, well, I go to church. And I pray at my meals. I pray with my kids at bed. And I just do it again the next day. And then I you know, maybe read my Bible, but then I go here and I just, just, just this routine. There's no, there's no fighting back. There's no nothing. We're just going through trying to enjoy this life in this little orbit that we're stuck in. And honestly, we lose sight of who we are. When we're worried about just our faith, the, the strength of the faith and, faith and not the object of our faith, we lose sight of who we are because without Jesus as our object, we are no one. He becomes our true identity. And so when we're not doing that, we don't know who we are. So it's no wonder that we're not good at fighting back with grace and love in this world of adversity. I know it gets me. 
as much as I love to, but it's no wonder that it's so difficult for us to do that because we, we don't know who we are. So what does it look like when we're trying to fight back? It looks like judgment and, hip- and hypocrisy because, no, we're not going to be perfect. So, yes, we're going to have some hypocriticalness in us, no doubt about that. But when we don't know whose we are, it just looks like hypocrisy. It looks like judgment. There's no love, there's no grace, and there's no humility in it. And I say that with passion because it rocks my world too. I'm not saying that it's just, just you guys, you know, those people over there. No, it's me too. I'm fighting in that same thing. But Paul grew in Jesus' grace and love, and that empowered him to fight back. Even after being beaten and jailed, I mean, that's incredible to have that power. And we have the same ability to have that type of power, to be able to fight back against that if we know who we are and whose we are. And I encourage you, again, read for yourself this week. Dive into the Word. Get a little bit about who Paul is because it's incredible the types of things that he's done and is doing. And so, of course, I don't go as long as everyone else is going because I still have tons of time left. <laughs> but I don't care because we're just rocking in here. I don't need to fill, fill the voids, fill the gap, and rock the word. Uh, I want to rock the word. Fill the void, fill the gaps. But I just want to... It just gets me every time when I'm looking at the life of Paul and I think about where he went and I just run back to that idea of the humility that when I think less of myself, he becomes so much greater. And yet, how often I don't do that. How often I I want to do that. I think that I want to do that. And yet we get so caught up And that same thing, it's been going on in the church forever. We come and we hang out in the pews, and it's so great and whatever, but then we just go and do our own thing and try and fit into the culture of the world rather than being the culture changers. You get what I'm saying? When we're fighting back with grace and love, we're no longer just, oh, we're going to do whatever's going on out there because that's the cool thing and we want to fit in. No, we're the ones that are going out there being the lights for Christ, and we're changing that culture. We're throwing that grace and love out there because we actually understand it. Do you understand it? I encourage you, if you don't, look it up. Dive into it. I can't give you all the answers up here. One, because I don't have all the answers. And two, because the best way to learn is for you to dive in yourself. What good does it do for me to try and lay it all out here and say, here you go. Here's the five-step plan for doing what you need to do. That doesn't do anything for you. You're really good at checking off boxes, which is what we're all good at anyways. And that's what we want to get away from. So here we go. How are we going to respond? Sorry, I didn't put that in the Yoda speak. (laughs) That's my speak. How are we going to respond to that? What should we do? We need to return to the object of our faith. Or if you don't know him, you need to respond to him for the first time. That's where we need to be. That's what we need to do. Because we need to be able to fight back with that grace and love. It's so, in my mind when I think about it, like I say it out loud to myself, it seems so simple. Yet how complicated is it when we get so fired up and then we walk away and then to still have this in our brains and to still wrap it around to think about it and go, whew, wow. Easy said, but not as easily done. But we need to know that we're not alone because he's fighting for us whether we know it or not. You know, that's part of what's so incredible is he's out there. Whether you know him or not, he's fighting for you. And when you do know him, whether you feel him or not, he's still out there 
Because I look at it sometimes and I go, but Stephen still died. My father-in-law still died from cancer. And I'm going to steal a little bit of what, what Luke said last week. And if you weren't there, it'll be brand new and you'll think I'm amazing. But he talked about we just look at these pieces of the puzzle. And God's rocking the whole thing. He knows it. And we dwell on this and think that it wasn't my way. He didn't do it the way I want. And we get so fired up about that. And yet, when he becomes bigger, we become smaller. And we fit into his plan rather than trying to fit him into our plan. And God is speaking. You're here. You're here. You're listening online. God is speaking to you because you're here for a reason. Maybe you're forced here. Maybe, again, this is part of your religious routine. But you're here. And God is speaking to you, and he's trying to tell you something. It may have nothing to do with the words. I was talking to somebody. Uh, I was talking to Kevin right before this. You got a pitching coach. Like, I've had a bazillion pitching coaches in my career. And, like, this guy will say the same thing as this guy, as this guy, as this guy. But it's not till number six that it just locks into your brain. And all these other five guys are like, oh, that's what I've been telling them for the whole time. So I hope that tonight is one of those moments for you. Not because, wow, Justin, you're such a great speaker. We really like listening to you. But because then God is working in your life and your ears are being attuned to what he's saying.